Ken Siegel is a marketing and technology guru with a background as a creative director who worked with Steve Jobs for more than 12 years. He's also one of the creators of the Think Different campaign for Apple and his idea of adding the letter I to the Mac started Apple's I Madness. Ken's secret dream has always been to become a script writer, and he already managed to write two technology-based thrillers. Some of the characters in his scripts are based on people he met in advertising, and he now hopes they won't make the connection. Let me start with the definition of yourself. You define yourself as a creative director who has had more than a few adventures in technology, marketing, including branding, product naming and strategy. You have a long history with Apple and Next where you took a blood oath to uphold the principles of simplicity. What kind of journey was that? A difficult one? Uh, yeah, you know, you look back at these things and you're very thankful that you had the opportunity to participate in things that, that made a difference in, in a company like Apple. And um, it, it, it is a long, hard journey. When you're doing it, it's kind of you know, how are we going to get past this one? How are we going to get past this one? And we're being, you know, it, Steve Jobs is demanding that that something be done by a certain date and all that kind of stuff. So it's hard work at the time, but when you're done, it's it really feels cool to look back and see, you know, what you and the group managed to produce. How did it feel when it was over, emotionally? Over meaning? The journey was over. You stopped working with oh, Apple. Oh, I see, right. Um, there was a, it was really difficult for me to detach myself from that. Uh, there were some personal reasons why I, did, I wanted to be based on the East Coast and not have to make so many trips to the West Coast. Mm. And there came a time where I had to just make that decision and move, but I knew that leaving Apple was going to be very, very difficult because I really loved the company and what it stands for and, you know, working with Steve Jobs, all that stuff. But by that time, I'd already had about 12 years of it, so it was time to, to move. Sort of a bittersweet moment, like, you know, now yeah. I could do something else, but I kind of, I'm always going to miss Apple. How much did it feel like an emotional journey for you? Did you have your ups and downs during those 12 years you worked with them? Yeah, yeah? I think um, there are <laughs> a lot of... How did they of, look like? There, it, it's referred to as a roller coaster by, yeah. by many people because those successes would come with great fanfare and, and it was just really good to see all the news coverage and, and Steve Jobs would be so happy and he might give you great compliments and it was, you know, you knew he had incredible standards so when Steve was happy it made you feel accomplished. But at the same time there were tough moments where we weren't able to do something the way Steve wanted it to be done or something couldn't be done in time or something didn't turn out as mm. good as we thought it was going to turn out and what are we going to do now and there's a lot of money at stake and, and product launches depending on our work and all that so you know it really is a roller coaster and it's one of those things when you look back at it it was like wow what a great experience but if you wanted to go to some specific times in there, it'd be like, oh my, you know, do we really have to endure any more of this? It's really hard work. Would you be please so specific and tell me at least to the tops and the bottom down what happened during that period, you know? Yeah. Like the mm -hmm. most admirable moment that happened with Apple? I think for me personally, it was yeah. the launch of iMac because that was a very important point. At, at that time in, in history, Steve Jobs had just come back to the company uh, six months before. And um, it was the first product they were gonna, going to launch that came under you know, the, the return of Steve Jobs, and it had to be great. And he wanted every single detail to be great. But we had a computer that didn't look like any computer that ever came before. It was colorful and shaped you know, more fun, translucent. I mean, it had a lot of things going for it that those boxy beige computers didn't have. So just being part of the launch event, and Steve would show the commercials at the event, and then uh, they were all over the air, uh, you know, the television shows were, were, you know, we were very, very visible and mm. newspapers, magazines, outdoor <laughs> boards, I mean, there was just stuff everywhere. And most gratifying were the, the critical reviews of, you know, people in the business or, you know, whoever writes these articles all over the place, you know, journalists about how Apple is doing and they, they went from they're going under, they're, they have no future to like, well, wait a minute, they have a really good product and, mm -hmm. and the advertising had some spirit to it and like, wow, maybe it's he's really going to do something. So that was great. 
As far as low points go, yes. um, one I remember in particular was the launch of the Power Mac G4 Cube. Oops. Now, I'm not sure if a lot of people even remember it, but it was a gorgeous, a whole new idea. It was a desktop computer that was going to be somewhere between iMac and Power Mac. You know, Power Mac being for the pros. That The Cube was an 8-inch cube, and it was just this beautiful... Uh, it, it's actually in the Museum of Modern Art now. I mean, they, they, it's a, just a gorgeous piece of design. Um, and it would have been a hit if they could have gotten the price down. But there was a terrible moment in there when Steve realized that manufacturing-wise, they had to charge a certain amount of money that was like four or $500 more than he wanted it to be. So this was going to no longer be a consumer product, but it was going to be like a low-end pro product. Mm -hmm. And he thought that totally changes it and, and sort of ruins things. So, and that product only lasted a year before they discontinued it for that very reason. But from my point of view, we had to create advertising for this thing when it was launched. And I don't know why it was, but we could not get Steve to like a commercial for that launch. And we would normally get an idea approved, we'd go off and shoot it, and then while we're shooting we'd do like five or ten maybe even different scripts and different visuals while we were shooting, we'd have ideas, and we'd come back to him with, with a number of choices, and he might go for the original idea or he might like one of the new ones. Um, this particular time, we showed him a batch of commercials. We came back with another batch of commercials. We kept recutting it, and our editors were great. I mean, it, it looked so different every time, and we had different scripts and different music. It, it had so many personalities. When we were done, we had more than 50 different versions of this commercial, and Steve still didn't like any of them. Uh, like I say, normally it was just a few, and yeah. we'd go back and forth a couple times, but he, he just couldn't get himself to like any of our efforts mm. and we had some great spots in there so we were like three weeks late getting on the air because steve didn't like anything um and then he didn't really even like the one that he chose it was like well you know i'll have to settle for this one and then the product had problems because of the price that was a low moment because mm. i you know you wanted steve to be happy you wanted to to create work that fulfilled his vision and we all felt, we at the agency, that we, for whatever reason, we couldn't make him happy with these commercials. And, and we tried night and day for weeks. Mm. And he just, you know, never got past that. So that was a low point where, we, where I felt like, you know, something is wrong here. We're, I think we're doing good work, but Steve isn't liking it. And he, and he likes good work as a rule. So, um, and then the product went under. Yeah. So, it, you know, the whole thing was like from beginning to end just didn't work well. What was the feedback from him? Any acknowledgments? Any sweet stuff? Thank you, I like it. Yeah. Notes? Phone calls? Well, How you're, did you're it talking about like? in general. Uh, For you, personally, from him, from uh, Steve Jobs. Well, there's one great, great story I could tell you uh, about the launch of iMac, actually. Back in those days, the internet existed, but it wasn't used as much for, you know, you didn't go there to get all your product information. What we'd do at a launch was create like a 16-page piece that would run in the News Weekly magazines, like Time magazine. So we created this piece, uh, and he had approved all, you know, all the layout and the, the words, and everything was all set. Apple was sending us new photography as they changed the product. So we would always have to make sure we had the latest photography in there because they were making little subtle changes. So the thing was finally done, and I, I sent it to Steve for his final approval and said, this is going out to the, into the... Newsweekly, so speak now. And by the way, what you had to do to get into those magazines, you'd have to buy your own paper and make you know, truckloads of the stuff and make <laughs> millions of copy and sh sh copies and ship them to the publisher. Um, <clears throat> he got this thing, and, I, and it's one of those things like, you know, you remember exactly where you were when something happened in your life, like tragedy a perhaps. Scene, or, yeah. yeah. I remember every detail about this phone call I got from Steve because I was sitting at my desk and he was angry. Because he saw this um, this thing, there was one of the keyboard shots. Remember, the original iMac was blue, and the keyboard had a little blue around the edges. Mm -hmm. And he thought that color blue was off. It like wasn't the shade the right. of blue is not yeah, the right. Yeah, it one. wasn't quite right. And but he, you know, he told me that, and that's fine. But he went off and screamed his head off at me. And I mean, I was it was like scary. And I was like typing, you know, his. his what he was saying as he was saying it, just so I could share it with people. Um, so 
no problem. I mean, he thought it was a problem. He thought we were ruining the launch of this most important thing Apple had done to that date. And he literally said, you're ruining this, that you, you've destroyed it. And I was like, yeah, he was that extreme. And when we got the art in, so, you know, we, there was still time to change it. When we got the art, if you looked at these two things side by side, I, I swear you would not, you or I would not see a difference. <laughs> It, there was a subtle change in the color, and if you're a customer reading this thing, and you're, yeah, you would never in a million years, yeah. you wouldn't know it's wrong because you didn't, you wouldn't know what's right. But even if you compared it to the computer, which nobody would do, it wouldn't, it wasn't off by more than that. Um, so it's an interesting story because it demonstrates Steve's attention to detail. He wanted mm. every single thing to be perfect. So it's um, hard to please the man. <laughs> he, he would find, you know, something wrong that, you know, this is not going to go because we only do things absolutely perfect here and this launch is so important. And if, by the way, we weren't able to stop the publishing, he would have said, then you're paying for it and you're buying me a new truckload of paper. He would do that. He, he did things like that often, that, you know, I'm not paying for this because it's not up to my standards. So you um, have to deal with that. Uh, And you just, you know, you were on notice all the time. When you do something for Steve, it's got to be perfect and great. And I can why, sense this you know. kind of dichotomia because you have your ups and downs yeah. with the company, yeah. with the brand. So it is or was your beloved client. Yeah. But on the other hand, you can be able to heavily criticize the right. client for these steps. Now. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I think it's a funny dynamic because a lot of people who... I know a lot of people like me who really admire Apple. I think they've changed the world. I love the way they, they look at the world and the kinds of products they make. But when you, when you admire someone or love someone, you feel compelled to say, I don't like that thing you're mm. doing. Would you mind changing for me? <laughs> <laughs> and there are things that Apple does that, that my, myself, that me, my friends, uh, ex-colleagues criticize and say, like, I, I kind of wish they didn't do that. We don't do it because... We like to criticize, we do it because we want Apple to be perfect, and we think Apple should be perfect. And some of the decisions just seem a little wrong, and you hope that they, they modify their behavior. This thing that I stress is that the love of simplicity is built into every human being. I mean, it's just something you cannot deny. I mean, you would always rather do something in a simpler way than in a complicated way. And you, you love products that make things simple for you, and you are frustrated by products that, that don't. So that's all it really is about, and that's what Steve Jobs was about, I believe, that he wanted to go one way and not the other way, and, and going the simplicity route immediately made him different than anybody else, and it made Apple products different than everyone else, and it shows in, in the fact that they may not sell the most products, but they sell what they think are the best, and they charge a premium for that. So there, there are people in the world, a very large number of people, who would happily pay a little bit more to get something that they felt was very, very high quality and beautifully designed and easy to use. So that's what they do. And I think there are lessons in that for pretty much anyone, unless you want to sell to the mass market, low price uh, audience. And there are plenty of those people around, you know, and it just depends on what you feel good about doing yourself. If, if that's the way you wish to go, there's money to be made, I'm sure. But <laughs> Apple has a quality thing going for them, and it's, it's something that a lot of people appreciate. If I were to compare Apple, even knowing that we have certain issues with them today, um, comparing them to other companies, I don't think it's even close. I think Apple has a quality standard and a design standard and, a, and a, an ability to innovate that really isn't matched by anyone. You know, it may not always be yeah. that way, but I have great respect for them. Yeah. By the way, how did they like the book itself, the insanely simple book? Mm. Did you get any reactions on that? I don't really know, to be you honest. You don't know? No, no I, I don't uh, believe that. Yeah, I hear things, but um, Hearing nothing. Hearing what? <laughs> what kind <laughs> you of like response? You like to know. Uh, you know I mean, I, I've gotten compliments from people. Yeah. I haven't been attacked by anyone. I think, if anything, there is, uh, in general, you don't talk about some of the things that I might have talked about. but. I had some concerns about that, um, but at the same time, Steve Jobs' biography came out uh, six months before my book, and when I saw the things that Steve himself revealed to his biographer, I, I actually felt a lot better about it because yeah. my book is written with great admir admiration, and mm -hmm. I, I talk about some of the things he did in the course of business 
because they are, you know, heavy-handed or extreme or whatever, but I, I admire what he did and the results that he uh, accomplished being that way. And so, that's your story as well. It's yeah. not only his or Apple's stories, it's you yeah. involved in it. Yeah, that's true. Um, and in the Isaacson book, the biography, um, a lot of people don't like it because it makes Steve such a negative person. It, 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 I think it exaggerates the bad side mm -hmm. and doesn't talk enough about the good side because in truth um, he, would, he would have those explosions when, when, his, when someone was getting in his way, not, either not doing work that was good enough yeah. or not doing work that was fast enough. Um, <clears throat> But the rest of the time, he was amazing. You know, he, he was funny. He had a sense of humor, and, and he was interesting to work with. And he liked to talk about things other than work. You know, you sit yeah. there sometimes after a meeting and just talk about life. And it was interesting to get his point of view on on things about education and, and uh, adoption. He was an adopted child, mm -hmm. and um, I was at that time adopting a son. And it was you know had interesting conversations with him about that because he he. I don't, if you know his story, he found out later in his life when he when he reached his biological parents, he found out that um, they actually got married after they gave him up for adop adoption, and they had a daughter. So he had a full sister who he never had met until he was in his 20s or whatever. And it's a, a really fascinating story because she is quite accomplished. She's a famous author, Mona Simpson. So there's some really good genes in that family. Yeah. yeah. Talking about genes, you devoted your book to your son. To my you dedicated son, yes. the book to your son. Why? Well, um, it was actually quite a touching moment because I didn't tell him I had done that, and I told him that the first copy of my book was coming, and he had sort of lived through uh, my writing of the book. I was always locked away in my office. I can't talk now. I'm writing and stuff like that, and. Um, to the point where I think he got kind of um, frustrated with me as a dad. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're not around. I was like, I am too. I'm right around the corner. I'm just working. <laughs> I'll be out in a few hours. And um, so the first copy of the book came, and I, was, and I saw that, and I said, okay, so take a look at this. And um, even though he had been complaining, you know, when he saw that first page, he was like, I, I could just see it in his eyes. He was like so touched. Um, he couldn't believe I'd done that. You know, it's like, well, of course, you're my son, and you you've given me the time to write the book and everything. So, it was a great father-son bonding moment. You know? <laughs> it was it was more than worth it. If there is any lesson to be learned for your son, and you know, for all the people who read the book, the insanely simple, what is that? What is the message you're trying to get across mm. in the world? I think that a lot of people fail to understand that this thing that is so obvious and so available to anyone, um, you know, that this thing called simplicity is available to everyone and yet so few of us avail ourselves of it. Like we have, we face these decisions and these circumstances at work um, where you can let common sense and your instinct be your guide because how many times do we find ourselves in a situation where you think like, well, that's a horrible idea. Why are we doing it that way? And you, you go to lunch with your friends and everybody talks about like, whoa, can you believe we have to do this or whatever? It's like, we shouldn't have to do those things. If people stood up for what's right, I think that's one of the reasons why Steve Jobs ruffled so many feathers, so to speak, is that he wouldn't compromise on those things. And, and he wanted to do the right thing and the right thing made certain people uncomfortable because it maybe would require more effort or take more time or cost more money. But he, he was really adamant about doing what he felt was right. And what he felt was right was making great things and having his customers love Apple. So I think the lesson really is to not compromise on, on things that are important to you. And, and so many of us, I think in work situations, we tend to do that when it's like, well, you know, the boss kind of wants to do it this way, so it's not ideal, but let's do it. And I understand that what I suggest may cause people some trouble at work, <laughs> and, I, and I'm not telling people to just you know, violate all the rules and be a renegade and get yourself fired, but I think if more people really you know, acted on what they believe in their heart, that the world would be a better place. So I wish you a lot of luck. Thank and you. Thank you for this interview. My Thank pleasure. You.